Good morning and afternoon. Uh, thank you for, for taking your time and being in this second webinar for the protection analysis update rollout. Um, for the one that don't know me, I'm Francesco Michele. I'm the strategic analysis and advocacy officer in the global protection cluster, and I've been uh, leading the coordination of the work we've been doing on the protection analysis update and protection of risks and so on and so forth. Um, today's session is going to be again in English. I think that all of you are English speakers, but uh, as usual, you can address me in Spanish or French and I will answer to the best of my ability. Um, we are going to record the session, if you don't mind. So we, we will we are thinking to make it available in the in, uh, in the Global Protection Cluster website, so it can be used later for also other colleagues or if you want to share it further. Um, Today's, as you can see, today is the second webinar. We all, we we held an, uh, the first one last Wednesday, where we actually uh, dig deeper into the protection analysis of the new guidance, uh, so to provide a bit the basis. And today we're going to focus more on the protection risks, protection risks definitions, and how to go about um, showcasing protection risk and identifying them in protection analysis update. So today's is the second webinar and we're going to have a third one uh, end of April where the idea is to to actually have an open webinar um, we are going to hold the third webinar at the end of April. The idea is that uh, we that webinar will be a wrap up, uh, feedback, uh, challenges, discussion. So it's going to be based, much, going to be more practical, and we actually can look together on your actually feedbacks on the guidance and the potential analysis update, and so on and so forth. For today, uh, we divided the presentation in two parts. In the first one, we're going to do a bit of refresher of the session of last Wednesday for the ones of you that didn't participate. And we're going to look at the process of the protection risk definition and uh, a bit the goals, the objectives, and now the, what you're going to see in the definitions. Then in the second part, we're going to look at the practicalities. So we're going to concretely look into the protection analysis update, and uh, we plan to share some examples from uh, operation that already tested uh, a bit the definition in the protection analysis update or in other processes. Um, so that you have time and, pro and possibility to actually stop me, uh, please, uh, to ask question or if you need clarification. I have the tendency to speak fast, so, so stop me if uh, I'm unclear. But then at each part, we're going to have a Q&A session. We have some space of time to have a Q&A session to actually address whatever feedback you might have or question. Um, we can give it a start, but before, let me pause a minute. If you have any initial question or doubts before we start, otherwise, I'll ask you to give me a thumbs up if you want me, and I can start. Please, Natasha. I know, was a thumbs up. Raise hand. Yes, exactly. Sorry, wrong side. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. So let's give it a go. Uh, let's start a bit with a refresher of the session of last week that look into the, the new guidance. So last week, as we presented last week in the package that is now available in the website under the section of the protection analytical framework, you can find uh, two new formats for the protection analysis updates. Uh, as we discussed last time, the two new formats are what we call the PAU standard and the PAU brief. Uh, instead of just developing a format, this time we develop a complete sample. So a sort of protection analysis update complete that you can uh, that can inspire you uh, in uh, when you're going to use it in the operations. The second uh, the second elements of the guidance is the protection risk explanatory note that includes the definitions and a bit of guidance on how to adapt protection risk in PAUs together with a two-pager that provides a tutorial on how to draft a narrative analysis on protection risk in PAUs. Uh, lastly, uh, we develop also a guidance, a sort of visual guidance to help you out in using the PAUs formats. 
Uh, that guides on the use of the format itself, uh, the content, and it provides some indication on how to go about information and management graphs uh, and other elements. Today, specifically, we're going to look into uh, the two set of guidance related to protection risks. So the protection risk explanatory note and the tutorial. Last week, we delve into the first two, and today we delve into the second two. A, brief, a bit of a uh, um, uh, brief overview of the core changes for 2024 that we discussed last time. So we have the two formats uh, compared to last year, so not anymore one, but two. They are limited in pages, and that's one of the criteria for publications. Um, and then when it comes to protection risk, hence this session, uh, the idea that in the protection analysis update, now we focus only on five protection risks uh, that are priority for the period covered by the protection analysis update. And we strongly encourage, as we're going to see today, the use and uh, the adaptation of the 15 standards that we develop together with the areas of responsibility. The first set of changes it relates to the format itself and uh, uh, the simplifications we introduced. So you're going to find standard sections, executive summary, response, or recommendation. But also we introduced some publishing criteria uh, to simplify the use, but also to help us out in having a more consistency across operation. So the overall goal is that we, the PAU are much more effective, effective and have a more better impact uh, for, for your own goals and needs. And uh, the caveat being that as the global protection cluster, we're going to publish any analysis document you're going to share with us. Of course, what we're going to see now is whether we agree together with the cluster coordinator and co-coordinator to publish them as a protection analysis update or else. Uh, your um, contact point is the regional focal point in the global protection cluster. So the idea is to have an ongoing discussion together and actually to be a bit more strategic in the, in the publication of the protection analysis update. Lastly, uh, one call that we made in the last webinar is try to, if you manage, to sort of have a rough plan of all the protection analysis update that you would like to actually work uh, together with the constituencies in your operation for 2023 and coordinate with your regional focal point to see together um, a bit this mapping. The idea is that we would like to support you better, but also use more strategically the protection analysis update. So that plan can help us out in actually organizing a bit better and also to leverage opportunities that we might have at a global level. Today, we focus on the changes related to risks, so the definition and how to prioritize for the PAUs. And, and also, we're going to very quickly delve into a bit of the criteria specifically related to protection risks. And related to this, let me remind everyone that these are the four core criteria that we're going to use to actually decide together to publish a protection analysis update. The first one being on process. So as we say last time, we're not going to chase and we're going to do a check if you did a proper consultation, but we really invite this year to be much more consultative and try to have a better buy-in of also an analysis from the areas of responsibility, the partner and the important constituencies in your operations. The second criteria, again, is the limitation of risk that we're going to present in the PAU and the other two were are related to the minimum format and this ensuring that there is a standard executive summary. Again, looking at today, we are going to today focus on, uh, we're going to look a bit of details on the first two criteria, so a bit about the process and a bit about the risks. So uh, on the guidance itself, uh, what you're going to find, so just a bit of overview where after this webinar, where you can find the content that we are discussing. So you have two documents, the protection risk explanatory note and the tutorial on protection risks, where you can find the list, of the 15 protection risks, a short guidance for PAUs, so a bit on uh, how to adapt the terminology uh, as headers in your protection analysis update, and also how to go about the categorizations of, uh, of elements. Then uh, what we try to develop is for each definition of the protection risk, a one pager. So you can have the opportunity even to print out just the one page of the protection risks uh, that you might want to use or share with partners. So uh, the goal is that you have the full guidance, but then you can also use it separately for every need that you have. Lastly, again, to be a, to make a bit better linkages with the 
protection analytical framework. We are going to look at the tutorial. Today we're going to look at the details on how the protection analytical framework interrelate with the definition of protection risks. Uh, the refresher is this. Uh, of course, we discuss more, and we're going to last week, uh, and we're going to publish the recording. But uh, before entering now in the definition themselves, let me pause a second. If there is any question from the ones that didn't participate last week, if there is any clarification needed, uh, let me pause a second. Please raise your hand or write in chat. Otherwise, as usual, just give me a thumbs up, please. OK, thank you. So definitions. So the work on protection risk definition is not new. Uh, we've been building a bit on uh, the work that the Global Protection Cluster has been done since uh, spring 2021. So let me give you first a bit of background where they're coming from. So as said, uh, we have a Global Protection Risk Tracker uh, that has been established in March 2021 that, uh, as you see in the older version, uh, used a bit of mixed terminology that has been revised in uh, spring 2022 after the, 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 the endorsement of the protection analytical framework, that this alignment basically gave us the list of 15 that you have today. So the, the idea was to use the language that is in the concept matrix of the protection analytical framework, which was a concept matrix that was developed together with um, also ICRC, OECHR, and major partners in the protection sector. What we've been doing uh, since uh, September uh, of last year, we'll be starting a methodology revision that basically today we are presenting. It will not stop here, so we're going to work all years, but uh, the definition are the first step of the methodology revision that we've been doing. Um, the Global Protection Risk Cloud, uh, Tracker links up with the Global Protection Updates that we publish quarterly that you know uh, because also you contribute to them, uh, which are the flagship documents that we use for advocacy and communication and we use for donors engagement. So we have seen that these documents, specifically the Tracker, um, are quite interesting for donors and our targets. So that has the, the idea of actually working a bit better on the way we visualize and we identify protection risks. Lastly, this you know very much, is the protection analysis updates. Uh, the two just elements to add uh, is that we, we did a full-fledged lessons learned exercise covering all the protection analysis updates published since April 2021 to December 2022. We look at best practice and uh, what actually you have been doing. So all the guidance, it's uh, no new. It's, uh, we use best practice and, and uh, solutions applied by operations, actually, and we transform that in uh, global guidance. The idea, which is the major change for 2023, is to have a much more consistent use of protection risk uh, terminology and language. Uh, and the goal, as we will see afterwards in the next slide, is to have a much more systematic approach for advocacy and communication. The revision. Um, so the definitions that you have in the guidance has been developed together with the uh, whole global AORs um, with uh, three goals in mind. First of all, I mean, we just say that, but uh, ensure consistency in the way we use the language and the concept. But mostly, probably, this is the primary objective, is to have a unique protection narrative. So as a sector, being able to present analysis, recommendation, messages with a unique voice. So ensure our diversity in terms of areas of responsibility and, uh, and all the partners that we have, uh, because protection is quite wide. But in the way we present the analysis and also we do advocacy, try to be much more uh, stronger in having a unique voice. The goal, of course, is to have a better engagement of donors, duty bearers, but also UN leadership in your country, namely humanitarian coordinators, humanitarian country teams, and so on and so forth, um, which is much more focused on a human rights approach and a centrality of protection principle. So it can be used to link up with intersectoral processes. 
Uh, they use, of course, is the global protection update, the PAUs, but also from our side uh, at the level of the cluster, but also many of you, um, we use consistently, systematically uh, the protection risk analysis for advocacy messages in brief reports, donor briefing and external engagement. In terms of the process, without entering in the detail, uh, this I think it can help you out when you're going to explain to partners and you are in the country uh, where the definition comes from. We had, a, I would say, a good systematic approach in terms of consultations. So we involve all the working groups, task teams that we have in the Global Protection Cluster, as well as the area of responsibility from the onset. So even deciding together how the definition lo will look like, how should we, better we should be better present that, and how, sh should, how we should shape them in a guidance. So even before starting drafting the definitions, and of course we had an overall process that, that basically included three rounds of feedbacks that we finished at the end of January. One important aspect is, as you many of you know, and some of you are in the, are in the call, uh, we try to test out every single step and every single uh, version of the process uh, with operations to have a sense checking from uh, if they made sense in the field and of course uh, to see if they, they could be usable. Of course, the idea of 2024 is to start using them and, uh, and uh, run a revision at the end of the year to actually adjust uh, or, or, or change or modify better from uh, the use in the operation so we can be much more practical. Um, so the first element that you're going to see in the guidance that is basically one of the results of the exercise. As you know, the definition that we have of protection risk, uh, if it comes from the protection analytical framework. And protection risk is defined as the actual or potential exposure of the affected population to violence, coercion, or deliberate deprivation. So as you can see, we underline potential and then violence, coercion, deliberate deprivation for two reasons. We have been realizing that those elements are a bit challenging uh, when we go about monitoring or when we're going to go about presenting the risks. The first challenge that we identify is the fact that focusing both in the actual presence of protection risk and also in the potential is a bit confusing and it's not easy to, to actually have a good analysis process. But also externally, I, I would say that we have been challenged as a sector sometimes to, to clarify a bit better what do we mean when we identify protection risks. The second element is the concept of violence, coercion and deliberate deprivation, which are very broad concepts and are difficult to, trans to be translated in, uh, in data, in information, or in even in a, in a standard approach to actually showcase and present that. So what we try, what we propose uh, with the definition and uh, the whole work around the PAUs is to have an operational approach. So not to change the definition, but actually to look at the monitoring of protection risk from a, a, a sort of operational standpoint. So looking at protection risk, first of all, focusing on the actual protection risk. So what we see. And then, of course, probably in your operation, you might already have systems or we will be better in a sector. So then we are also able to identify the potential. But first of all, focusing on the actual. So uh, the old definition are based on the elements that you see there. So each protection risk should look into the intensity and damage or harm resulting from a human activity or a product of human activity, of course, affecting an individual or group of individuals. So we divided these three elements of, let's call it the operational definition, because we use them to, to organize the, the description of each risk. So the, this you will see during the whole webinar, but it's through uh, three elements that might be helpful for you to, to keep in mind. Of course, when we look at them, there are two areas that are not easy to be identified. One is the concept of harm, because from the protection perspective, when we speak about harm, we speak about physical and mental integrity, but also material safety and also violation of, of rights. So the concept of harm, uh, together with the concept of human activities, are concepts that probably are difficult to represent only with data. And here is where it's important to start using better our knowledge or our partner and constituency knowledge of the context to qualify better the data we have. This is already a, a, a key to, to go about the, the narrative analysis as we discussed uh, uh, last Wednesday. 
The second concept, which probably sometimes is much more difficult to qualify, is the human activity. Because human activity, even from looking at the, the normative aspect of it, might be a direct act, a measure or a policy. So a perpetrator is actually purposefully doing something, a threat or a violation. But also when it comes to duty bearers or the actors that are holding responsibility, uh, it might be a purposeful inaction. Okay, or an inaction due to unwillingness or to no, no capacity. So it's extremely important to understand the role of the either authorities or the actors that are holding responsibility. Again, it's one of those concepts where data is not helpful enough, and we actually have to combine that well with the knowledge of uh, all our consistency in, in the operations. Um, I can't see the chat, so please stop me eh, if you have any doubts. So when you are going to when you're going to see the definition, you're going to see two things. We organized each definition in three paragraphs, very short and uh, very simple, um, and then we're going to look at the detail. But then we start also working together with the colleagues of OECHR uh, in uh, linking up each protection risks with uh, elements to reinforce our human rights engagement, starting from the analysis. So the idea is that. There are actors, some of them are also partner of our, of our clusters in, in your operations, that are strong in doing human rights work, but sometimes we have difficulties in having a good communication in terms of language or concept. So the idea is to elaborate, and we are working on that, and we're going to finalize in the second quarter of 2023, to, to have a, might be an addendum or some elements more to add it to the definition that can really guide us in what to do in terms of human rights engagement, how to share information with whom and with which mechanisms when we identify our protection risk and we have the analysis. But focusing now on what you have in the guidance, the definitions include first a description of which acts, events or situation that constitute the presence of the risks. Of course, it builds on, uh, on uh, language, a normative language or legal language, but we try to make the definition very simple and really qualify what are the acts or the events or the situations. This second paragraph uh, provides a bit of an illustration of what factors might be interesting to look at when we monitor those protection risks. So, of course, we have the acts of the events, and when we have data and when they are manifest, they're much easier to be to be looked upon. But then there are elements like, as you can see in the in the brackets, lack of proportionality, distinction, legitimate purpose, and so on and so forth, which actually require us to look a bit broader and and uh, and other factors in order to actually be able to say that there is a protection risk in the country. The latest paragraph uh, is not a NIAM uh, specific. Uh, uh, guidance, but it provides an initial elements on what type of information or data can be identified to illustrate the presence of the risks. So we did this paragraph, uh, and it's the overall goal of the whole guidance to maybe help you out to have a very uh, a joint work between our IM colleagues uh, and the colleagues that are actually drafting the analysis, because we've seen that sometimes that might be a challenge. So this last paragraph might be helpful to actually have a dialogue with the colleagues uh, in the cluster, but also with the partners that actually focus on IAM. The, the definitions, they, they, we, we purposefully not use specific legal language, or of course we have to sometimes, but not too technical and not too legal, so they can be much more understood, uh, even if we want to share them or discuss them with our co local colleagues uh, or local partners. And, and of course, we are going to work as uh, the beginning, as you can see on the incipit of this slide, uh, on all the human rights and IHL part. What does this mean concretely? Uh, and I will show you a bit an example without reading all of it, but uh, at least to give you a sense of what you can see uh, when you're going to look at the guidance. So the first paragraph, it really is, fo is focused. So the, this protection risk includes acts that deprive or preempt people to rightful access to economic resource assets or livelihood opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So it provides, first of all, an overview what the risk is about. Then, uh, since the categories sometimes include more than one uh, type of violations, uh, if this happens, those are described very um, specifically. So as you can see here, 
discrimination includes, and then you're going to have a definition, stigma includes, and you have a definition, uh, as well as denial of equal opportunity and denial of humanitarian access. So you can have a general sense of what the risk is about, but also you can have a sense of the different components of the risk. So you can use them in your dialogue on the joint analysis work that you're going to do with partners. When it comes to monitoring, uh, we it's it's quite a general and illustrative paragraph sometimes, uh, but basically, it, 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 as you can see, it just says that the monitoring of this risk or, or the risk requires, and then it provides you some elements. So in this case, we are speaking about denial of resources or opportunity and discrimination. So it says it requires an attentive understanding of every situation where people are excluded from the use or enjoyment of resources, facility, assets, right. This includes, and then there is specific details. Across all the definition, you will see that specifically for certain risk, we try to make a distinction on what to look at in situation of armed conflict and what to look at in situation of either natural hazard or protracted or complex crisis. Because sometimes uh, what we need to identify change, specifically when it comes to armed conflict, because there is all the Geneva Convention and some principle that applies. Um, the idea is to explore this better also from uh, from your use, uh, but at least we try to give an, an initial general sense. Lastly, uh, when it comes to the sort of ideas of what uh, data information can be helpful, we try to give a sense of what is also needed beyond the protection set. I think that all of you have demonstrated in the last year and a half and even before that we are very good in using our data and our information. Uh, but in order to be stronger in the narrative, but also to qualify better protection risks, uh, sometimes it's good to have other sector or other type of information. So here also we provide that type of uh, clarity where it would be very much interesting to have other sector data. So in this case, specifically, when we look at denial of resources or opportunities, uh, one of the examples that you can see at the beginning of the paragraph, say factors to be observed can include data on food security and so on and so forth and also disruption of livelihood and markets. So these paragraphs sometimes can help you better in uh, having a focused approach also in engaging other sectors, because sometimes it's difficult to identify which sector will be good to, to engage in our joint analysis. So here we try to give you some elements in terms of, of maybe looking at what type of information data is needed can help you out in rationalizing even the approach with other sectors. So the old definitions, all the 15, are structured exactly the same with these three paragraphs in mind. And again, you have the one pager in the protection risks explanatory note. Concluding this part, and then we can pause a bit for, for your initial reflections. Uh, this is the final list. Many of you have seen it already because it's been used in the past. Uh, what you can see highlighted in red uh, are the changing in terminology that uh, resulted after the consultation with the AORs and all the partners. And those changes, I would say that what they do is that they make better use of specific AOR language that sometimes in the former definition were not there. One example is forced recruitment, where the language used in, uh, in child protection is association of children in our forces and group and not, and not recruitment specifically because it might be other form uh, of association that are also violation, but are not recruitment itself. Um, and also try to, to, to have a better linkages with legal or human rights language, also to reinforce the human rights engagement afterwards. So I would say that the, the, the results of the, the whole consultation we did is to ensure that this 15 list, first of all, capture everything that we do in protection, more or less, or everything that we analyze, also, the uh, added responsibility specificity. So as you can see, even if they are not represented clearly, but all the what the added responsibility analyze is in there, and we have been uh, making sure uh, to have a huge consultation with them to ensure that. And secondly, also in terms of language, should should be it's much more coherent with existing language. So those two elements might be helpful in your day-to-day -day work now on analysis, also in engaging with partner constituency and AUS. I will leave the slide there and I will pause a bit if uh, I would like to hear from you if there is any question, doubt. In any case, a bit of, of a pause because the next part is going to be a bit also heavy in terms of uh, practicalities. 
please do come in, even if some of you already use them, if you want to share any challenge or any feedback. Please, Arjun. Hi, Francisco. The only one point we had uh, a kind of counter argument is that the GBB, the gender-based violence, I think team on the ground says that it has to be in build into all different uh, the protection risk and it is not standalone uh, risk to be highlighted um, and, and just a thought from the field or thank you Arjun. no actually that's a great point because uh, it, it it gave me the space to actually share the, the, the work we've been doing with the GBV colleagues. We had that exact question with the colleagues of the GBV AOR for two months. So on all December and all January, we actually reflected specifically on that part. Um, the gender-based violence colleague, uh, they decided to do an internal consultation uh, in December because our proposal was to actually change the terminology of the risk number eight, so the gender-based violence one, uh, to focus on specific core violations, GB violation, and streamline the rest. Also because the number, um, which one is this now? The number five, discrimination, discrimination, denial of resources, you will see, ah, thank you, Claudia. So I will repeat the last sentence. Also because in the exercise, the definition of the risk number five, the denial of resources, builds on the GBV definition. So the agreement that we had with the colleague of GBV is in this now not to change it, so to keep it as a standalone, but in the guidance clarify very well that the GBV analysis should go across all risks. And we're going to discuss today how. And then look at what is the practice from operation and maybe doing a revision at the end of the year. So thank you, Archer, for that. And uh, it's good to see that the reflection that we had at the global level also is something that you have seen in the field. So at the moment, I will share that's the message that we can share. What is important is that even if it's a standalone, it will be important to involve the GBV colleagues when we identify other risks. I don't know if I answer actually. Yes, thanks. Thank you very much. Any other comment from uh, practice or something that is not clear so far? Yeah, well, Francis, is me again. Uh, Please, uh, the, the number 15 and, yes. uh, and number 12 sort of practically overlapping for us. And then we also having uh, some discussion. We have to actually put this post eviction over. Thank you. So let's do like, uh, let's, uh, that's a very good element, a very good point. Uh, um, we're going to have in the next part the discussion how to link up certain risks. So maybe let's rediscuss this, actually. We'll come back to you after that part to reflect if whether some of the proposal might help or if we have to adjust. Okay, thank you. Please, Eleonora. Thank you. So for um, the protection risk number 15, when we were looking at those in, the, in Ethiopia uh, with the subnational clusters, um, we identify that could be difficult for us uh, to um, uh, to classify um, the 15 because we have some issue uh, that we see related to freedom of movement. We have also some displacement that are not particularly um, voluntary, let's put it like that, but we don't have cases of siege. So the colleagues from the field were like, how do we classify that? Um, or how we establish the severity about this, since there are basically three things that are slightly different, complementary if you want, um, but we don't see all of them. Over. Thank you, Leonora. Two other very important points. Um, I think that some of that will also be addressed in the second part, uh, um, because we understand that since these definitions are overall encompassing, so sometimes it's, it's it's difficult actually to understand what you're actually saying. You know, if we have just one element of it, how do we, we identify? So the first point is that uh, we will you can adapt them. So the idea is that these categories 
are good are categories that we can use between the cluster in operation and the global protection cluster to know what you're talking about. So because we are also building a system uh, to simplify the way you present the analysis to us and then we use it globally. So it's just a matter of organizing internally. Then the actual use in the operation, there is full flexibility, even to adapt the terminology with some caveats. So that's something that can help. The second element is related to severity. That's a, a, another a parallel exercise that we, that we identified. So at the moment, what I can share is that we developed, we started developing criteria for the severity of uh, the, the five level of severity for each risk, which we're going to test out in this month global protection update. So in this month's global protection update in the form that you usually use for the global protection update, you're going to see already the initial criteria. The idea is that the criteria we develop are absolutely not perfect and we can test them with you because of course criteria are quite a, an exercise, they have to be current and so on. One of the things that I can tell you is that I think that the way we develop the criteria will allow you to identify better how to, even if you don't have all components. So we really focus on even if you have just one component of what the risk entails, you can actually identify the severity. So as a summary, yeah, the criteria we're working on them. We are going to actually have the possibility of testing them this month and coming back with feedback so we can really work together and having an operational perspective on the criteria, so not a top line one. Uh, and the second, let's uh, maybe look at the second part, Leonora, and then I can come back to your point on the number 15, if it's okay. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Any other reflection? Give me a thumbs up if it's okay. Uh, if you're still fresh and you want me to continue. Claudia, I guess it was a thumbs up. No, sorry, actually, yes, ah, it was, ah. but also I have something and I apologize Please. because uh, it's a bit, uh, the connection is not very good here. Um, in terms of HLP um, related issues, right? I mean, you can, as you said, each of these 15 protection risks actually will feed into and will be complemented by the AORs and the way that uh, the risk also affects uh, other correlated aspects. I just wonder, um, based on previous experiences in other operations, if you envision something specific to HLP, which goes beyond the nine, which is legal identity, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to proven, proving ownership, uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera. Just a curiosity. Thank you, Nicoletta. So uh, with the HRP colleagues, uh, um, because we asked the AUOS at the very beginning of the process, which risk they wanted to, de to develop with us that actually reflect what did they do. The HRP colleagues came back and we worked together, the number nine, but also the number 12. So the number 12, it's uh, developed specifically with them, so it captures uh, the whole rest of area that they, they work on. Uh, but then we realized from practice, that's something that I realized recently when a couple of PAUs that I received, that there is a, an element of land and all the entitlement on lands and uh, lands issue, conflict on lands, that might not fall well in those two, two categories. So, for instance, in one PAU, what we've been doing is to link that up uh, with the part of denial of resources and opportunity. So, deny, you know, the all impediments, the, the unlawful impediments to actually access to land and all the conflict related to that, it was actually used in, in that one. Um, so, to conclude, yes, those two at the moment, but I think that HRP is one of those areas where we will have to explore. And, uh, and we have to see what we come about because we have seen that sometimes are related to conflict, but sometimes are not. Thank you, Claudia, for, for the reflection. Any other burning reflection? Otherwise, let's center in practicalities. So, beside definition, what you have to do, you, are, you will have to do is to actually do the work and engage partners, engage constituency, engage actors, identify and prioritize. And we know all the challenges related to that. So what I wanted to uh, delve into now is how to use the PAU tactically and strategically in order to navigate all that process, and then provide you a couple of examples that you maybe you can use uh, in your operation. Again, stop me at any time. 
Let's look at the PAU. So the first slide is a replica of what we saw uh, last Wednesday. So apologies for the one that participated. So the protection risks, the, the PAUs include one section of protection risks, limited in pages. I think it's, I made a mistake, it's not maximum three, I think it's maximum six. But anyway, it's limited in pages. The goal of limiting it in pages is the format already asks to be very focused on the last period. So not to have this long narrative, try to include everything, but we need to include what is the focus on. And the second element, of course, is the prioritization of five risks uh, for the period. We will see later that there is no need to prioritize only five, but at least for the PAU, try to come out with just five so we can really have a strong narrative and that they can be that linked up together. But also try now with the definition and so on and so forth to, to have a better engagement of AUR and also all the constituency when we develop the PAU. So not just because we've seen in some operation the exercise where, for instance, the AUR colleagues were asked only to feed in their area. The goal is that, because I think that it's coming from operation, is that we try to have every AUR feeding in all the risks because all risks are interconnected. They are not just impacting the population autonomously. Um, so try to have a better engagement on that side. As we were discussing, as we were mentioning before, Eleonora, uh, I, I, just, just because I think this answered a bit to your question, when you use the protection risk in the PAUs, there is no need of using the exact terminology. So we provide uh, we provide in the guidance a bit of uh, a bit of guidance, so a bit of hints. They are actually coming from operation again, but let me let me have a bit of uh, an overview here. So the first suggest the first hint is not a suggestion um, is to avoid the general terminology. So these are actually examples that we have seen in certain operations. So when we describe risk number one and we put the title of the risk, avoid all forms of violence because maybe they might, they might be present, but that's really not helpful in engaging even the HCT, HCT the, the humanitarian country team and other actors. So really try to avoid the general formulation. When it comes to house, land and properties, and we made the example because we have seen that sometimes, but it really doesn't tell what is the issue. So there might be house and the property issues, but what is the concrete risk that we want to visualize for the period? And then maybe the other elements of the house and property are interrelated. The second uh, uh, guidance is to protection of risks are a form of violence, coercion, and deliberate deprivation. So they are strictly related with human activities. So the perpetrators, action or inaction of beauty bearers and, and authorities, as we have been seeing at the beginning. So always try to qualify, when you adapt the terminology, try always to qualify it with wording that help in showing the human elements of it. So here there are some examples, use force, use denial, use impediments, and there are some that are quite evident, like attacks, cruel, and so on and so forth. The third, the third area to think about when you adapt the protection risks uh, is what happens in those crises where an, an issue beyond protection is the core issue in the country. I'm thinking about food security or malnutrition, which is some crises are the crises. So uh, on our side, let's always make the efforts to link up what is the protection risk perspective on that issue. So when it comes to food security, uh, what is the protection risk that acts as the driver or one of the core driver that we see? Um, or what is the protection risk that actually is exacerbated and it's created a circle by which people falls back into food security? That can really make our narrative stronger. And I'm making that specific example because we did a recent exercise with our colleague in Somalia to actually look at stigmatization of specific ethnic groups as the core elements that is exacerbating the food security and malnutrition situation. Lastly, again, this is a link to the first one, but also generalized uh, terminology like conflict, ongoing violence. Uh, let's avoid that. All those elements should be either in the context or in the narrative analysis. But when we come to the title, Let's try not to be so generic or so generalized. Um, so you will see a bit more of detail in the guidance, uh, but uh, as you will see, what we try to, to, to give are not too prescriptive guidance. So our goal is that we are very strong in using the language of protection risk, but you have wide flexibility in actually adapting the language to your own situation, like uh, some of the examples that you just expressed. Um, 
Now we're entering a bit now to use the path. So let me pause a second. If there is anything of this that addresses some of your challenges, or if there is something that you don't agree with, or if there is any question, otherwise give me please thumbs up as usual. Thank you, Stuart. So one other things that we try to a bit address is how the protection analytical framework interrelates with the protection analysis update. So in the former guidance, of course, it was all built in the protection analytical framework, but in the in the new in the revised one, we try to link better some elements. So the, the, the core elements are the path logic. So not all the information, not all the data, not all the structure, but the logic. So threads, the effects of the threat and the capacity. It should be the underlying logic when you're going to draft a narrative. So in your brain, in your mind, always, or the, the colleagues' mind when they draft, always to try to use that sequence because I think it simplifies first the way we present consistently in your operation and across operation, but also it simplifies the way of presenting the narrative. Um, then uh, this is might go a bit beyond uh, just the path itself, but it's extremely important to use the protection analytical framework questions to understand what concretely we might need from other sectors, because that really brings, reinforces our narrative. So of course, organize our data, but also try to pinpoint well what other sectors information might be needed for analysis. Uh, so when it comes to the path, uh, these three sections, the context, the protection risk and the response, is if you're using the path actively or if you use the path of inspiration, that should be the basis and the foundational aspects of our analysis. Those are three sections where you can actually include all the analysis that's coming from the use of the, the protection analytical framework. When it comes to context, in the context, since the, the, the idea is to focus much more on update for the period, really use the context to highlight past occurrences or trends on protection threats, not a generalized context analysis, but very concrete trends or past occurrences that are linked with the protection risk that you're going to present in the PAU. Then very detailed specific political and socioeconomic situation, enablers of drivers, not just a national level. Actually, it's much stronger sometimes if we do a zoom in specific geographic area. So um, I think that generalized context analysis are present in almost all the crises we are. So here we can you can really focus on specific areas and specific geographic situations. And then look at uh, the current, the, what is in the laws, in the policies, but also in the cultural and the social norms that actually have a strong influence on the protection risk that actually being identified. You know, I mean, I, I might come to the top of my mind, forced marriage, that sometimes it's just a coping strategy, but when it happens in context with forced marriage is actually culturally present, like say systemic, then that risk is much stronger. So uh, the context is where you can really focus uh, to provide those elements. The protection risk uh, section, and it comes without saying, is where we have the core analysis. So where we present the threats and effect and the capacity. But then there is an element of capacity that now in, with the new format, you can also use uh, to, to qualify well the response section. So, of course, what is available in terms of protection response capacity, and as we have seen last Wednesday, the idea is not to present here the full dashboard for 5W and funding and so on, but really to use just those elements that are that can show the challenges, as you can see in the second, that are limiting our response. So we have the protection risk analysis where we're saying this is happening, and these are the challenges either in access or some of the elements that never have an effect of how the protection risk is impacting the population, either negative or negatively or positively. Now we look at a bit of an example, which is exactly the example you're going to find in the protection risk tutorial, the two pages that is part of the guidance. I, I, I extract some parts, but just to show you what is a bit the logic. So the logic is, even in that tutorial, is to present you the narrative analysis, so the way we eventually are going to draft the PAU, but a bit the linkages with the category of the protection analytical frame. So the goal here is that this guidance can help you out in establishing a good communication with the IUN colleagues. So 
the way you want to present it. So the IAM colleagues know the way you want to present it. But also you know what the IAM colleagues can give you in those different categories of the protection analytical framework. So in the tutorial, and here's some extraction, you see the paragraph. So this is coming from the sample of the PAU. So they are they're all interrelated. So the example you're going to see is the exact sample you're going to find in the guidance. So as you can see here, starting from a thread, so I will not read the full paragraph, but here it's according to the system we have in this scenario to, to get the data. So the Sarami National Police in this case, we have these numbers for this period. And uh, we also present a trend. It's a variation compared to the fullness period. Simple, straight to the point. We know long paragraphs with many information, but very concrete what we've seen. Then uh, we can have that. Of course, I choose one, but we can have different uh, part of the paragraph that actually qualify the situation of the, uh, the population that is affected by that risk, either in terms of how and why they are vulnerable to the risk, or general composition showing the, 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 the locations, uh, the, the movements they have, uh, the exposure they have, and so on. So in this paragraph, for instance, you can see a, a good, I think a good, a disaggregated outlook for, for type of population, so men, women, and so on. But also, well, sometimes it's, it's very interesting to do is to focus on geographic areas. So not all the countries, so it's good to have the area, but since we want to provide an update, if you don't have the whole data for the country, but you have both quantitative or qualitative information from your partners or, or uh, sub-coordinators on specific area, let's qualify that. Then threats, effects, capacity. Capacity, I, we have seen that generally, we of course, we focus on the protection response capacity. So we provide information about the type of response we have, the service we have, and so on and so forth. Um, but the path invites, and I think it's interesting to provide some insights that go more on the data. So, because the data can be shown with other products you have in the cluster. So the PAU is where really you can say what you want to say. You can show what you really want to show. Now, not you specifically, but what the whole protection constituents in the country want to show. So here you can see an example to, for instance, first start with local mechanisms that we have seen that are either working or not working, that are addressing that risk. Here, the, the risk is it's about attacks. So here, as you can see, it's a very qualitative information. So the, uh, to mitigate the violence, so the, the driver of the attacks, in these specific governorates, uh, the governors have been trying something. So in this case, they've been trying to deploy peaceful coexistent committee. So there's been a capacity that has been put in place. But also what we're saying is unsuccessfully. So we're not providing the whole detail why, because it's a top line analysis, then you might have other information that can back this up when you're gonna present it. So we focus on what is the existing local mechanism, what has been tried, where, and a bit of highlights on if it was successful or not successful in addressing some of the situation of the risks. Then following up on the, the tutorial, I just jump on the section. Um, we, in the, in the sample of the protection analysis update, you will see that we presented a trend so here we are focusing on some elements of the protection response on the international response, but looking at one specific trend that we identified. So in this case, this new trend, uh, now I don't remember the example, together with something that happened globally, so a decision of the Security Council to renovate the mandate of a UN mission, this is a fake one, but um, might have positive effects. So also we qualify what's happening to the situation we see. Lastly, it's interesting sometimes uh, to show here the, the, the category that is, called, that is in the path called, it calls the parent, but what element uh, you have seen uh, that are actually having an effect on the protection risk. So in this case, looking at the example, again, we have been presenting an improvement in the example. So this improvement is not expected now for the next semester since uh, the departmental leaders of the art groups have a high level of autonomy. So the improvement is a new law. So good that there's been a new law that's been changing the situation, but now we don't see the effects. So we might expect effects in the next period, but not now. So this also is important, uh, even to uh, counter arguments when we present the analysis. Ah, but now there is this new thing, there is new law. Yes, there is, but we didn't see this. It's not having an impact yet on the operation. So, 
I will stop here for a moment. So the idea of this is really the protection of this section is where you have full flexibility because you have to adapt to all your processes, but we provide a bit of inspiration on how to go about it in organizing between threats, effects, and capacity, and also try to, to, to link it up on uh, how to balance both quantitative and qualitative information. So more the knowledge and the understanding that you have as a protection sector overall in the country, rather than just focusing on uh, a reporting of simple data, because as you very well know, Oftentimes, we don't have the data that we would like to have. So if we just rely on the quantitative data, it's difficult to showcase well the risks. Let me pause. I will look now into the interaction with the older section of the PAUs, because this is just what goes into the protection risk section. But let me pause a second. If you have any initial reaction or comment. Hi, Francis. Questions? Let you again. Please uh, a quick, uh, yeah, a, a, a quick reflection from the field is that, uh, the, particularly from the donor community, they do not understand uh, the shift in the in the analysis, and uh, I have also had a couple of discussions and also um, through various meetings we learned we need more analysis, we need detailed analysis, you know. So these are some of the things that quite often. Uh, uh, you know, we are receiving, and I think uh, the GPCS takes sort of a, uh, I'm not sure that the briefing or whatsoever, so the people also understand this is how it works. And then, of course, I think they're they are just looking for more data contest analysis with the percentage graphs and so on. And that also putting us some sort of pressure. Or... Thank you, Archie, for that. Um... I don't have a straightforward answer. I have some reflections on that. Uh, I mean, the first one is uh, let's look together. So actually, maybe we can follow up as well to see how to also maybe engage donor on our side. OK, so uh, because now the guidance was really focused to support you. But then we can, if you think it's important, we can have a specific step at the global protection cluster level to show the way we're doing analysis. I think that's can be something that we can follow up. There are two situations sometimes, because also it's, uh, it's related to your example. Donor ask us for what is reporting more than analysis. Okay, so I think it's important to start clarifying what is analysis and what is reporting. So you have very good information. So for instance, in Afghanistan, you have a very good protection monitoring uh, system. So I think it's good to maintain protection monitoring report, uh, situational update based on data and so on, they can give an account of what the data says. But when it comes to the protection analysis update, those are a specific focus. So one of the things that happened in the last year is that it seems that the protection analysis update should replace everything we do. The simplification we introduced for 2020-2023 to actually uh, guide you and simplify for you the use of one or the other. So sometimes you will need to provide reports with data, uh, but then the protection analysis update should help you out in being much more the advocacy oriented one, where we actually say things even if we don't have data. One thing that was happening in the past is that it was a cumbersome process. So the goal to have, to have it a bit more less cumbersome is actually so then you can really focus and have time for, for presenting the rest. Uh, that would be my initial reaction, Archo. I don't know if it does answer, but I think that's an ongoing reflection we should also have with the with the donors on that side. I don't know, Archo, if it's okay. Yeah, thank you. Any other comment? I mean, based on Archo reflection, do you have a similar situation in other operation? Let me ask. Just to pause a bit before I move on. You're going to have probably more reflection when you're going to start using them. Should I continue? A bit of thumbs up. Is it okay? So, um, we now looked uh, into the protection risk section, which were we at the core analysis. But the overall goal of the PAU is to actually interrelate the different sections. So here a bit of uh, what is in the guidance, but then of course you have a huge degree of flexibility, so you can maybe devise better, better ways. The first uh, part is of course the executive summary. 
where we provide a list of the risks. The idea is just to provide a list. So the idea is that the executive summary being the first page is where we're also telling basically who's going to read the analysis, what to expect in the analysis section. So and they, and they all, even purposefully not to put details, so they're going to look at the potential risk analysis section. Then the context. The context, of course, uh, is what we include, what we discussed, drivers and all the contextual elements that are important to understand the risks. Last time we also discussed on the initial table of core data, so present just the data that is important to understand the risk you're outlining for the period. But then from practice, what we realize is that sometimes in operation you have a need of identifying more than the five risks. So the context, the context can be also, you can include another risk or a past occurrence of risk that is actually maybe acting as a driver of what you're going to present in the risk section. I can make very shallow example. One is if there is the risk of attacks because there is ongoing violence. Maybe since you already say many times there are attacks and it's no, there is no need of writing attacks in the protection risk section. It's, that can be part of the context. So in the context, uh, the attacks with this data, this information, and this frequency is what actually is impacting uh, or is actually causing the presence of different risks. And then you have the risk section where you actually you dig in. Uh, but then maybe also that interrelates with the sequence sometimes of risk, you know, um, when, uh, for instance, attacks and forced displacement. Maybe you want to put an accent on forced displacement, then you could put the, the, the risk side into um, the context. Maybe you want to put a focus on another risk, which is attacks, because it's much more relevant for the period and the conversation you're having in the country. So you can showcase the generalized situation of displacement uh, in the context. So again, the idea is that you really can use flexible all parts to let you to, to present what you comes out from at, at your level in the operation. The response, even though as we discussed last week, it showcased the progress we made, the challenges that we had in terms of access and, and, and operate, and then critical gaps. Uh, the idea is that what you try to do is to link up a bit in order to showcase capacity, as we saw before for the past. So uh, there is a lot more of narrative or qualitative part that can be introduced, even to focus on geographical area. So there is no need specifically that you refer to the risk, but you can just showcase what is important to understand the risks. And lastly, on recommendations, uh, the recommendations are strictly and concretely organized by risks. The goal is eventually uh, we, you might be supported to develop a roadmap of recommendation that can actually be followed upon. Because sometimes when we develop recommendation, it's difficult to follow up with partners, constituency, and AUR. But if we work well identify core risks, uh, we could think we could be able to develop an integrated response based on many recommendations, and those can be also used for strong engagement with humanitarian country team and humanitarian coordinators, specifically when the humanitarian coordinator has a responsibility in terms of centrality of protection, so focusing on risk and device strategies. So all in all, the idea of all the analysis that you provide is to use flexibly the protection analysis update to provide the analysis. So, don't be, um, don't get just lost in the format. So context is where we present a general context, responses when we provide response, but really use all the different part to bring together the voice and the data and information that you have from the partners for the period. Let's use it very strongly. Then all the other analysis the products that you have for 5Ws, funding gaps, uh, um, protection monitoring reports or other situational reports, they can, they can be, much better use because and you can develop them as, with the system you have and use the PAU to actually give a sort of rational narrative of why you have all of that, those things in place and what all those data is saying. Okay, that's the message. So on the PAU, use it flexibly, uh, collect, collect, connect the paths, uh, and um, and I think uh, as it is now, it's a bit more, at least from my, my point of view, it's a bit simpler in the, in, the, in the way to go about it. Let me pause again. Uh, I want to show you a bit, two or three examples before we come to an end uh, from operation, uh, from the analysis process, but let me pause a bit if you have any question again. Looking at the chat. Thank you, Claudia. 
So some practice. Uh, on the way to go, in terms of processes, system, and so on, uh, we purposefully are not working in, uh, in developing, and we wanted to start with the guidance because we really believe that you in the operation know how to go about things. And actually, a couple of examples that I'm presenting are examples from operation. So operation that either already tested and tried the protection risk and the new formats, or operation that use already the protection analytical framework and there is to work about them. So I provided three examples, but there are many others, and uh, we are now working on uh, with Vincenzo and the colleague of the IM team to try to map out all the best practice we have, with the idea of having also a community of practice that can showcase good examples in, from different operations. But the three examples today are just uh, an initial hint on how to identify protection risk, how to use uh, information uh, to use data, and the last one, how to prioritize. So on the first one, how to identify. Again, these are examples from operation eh, to, to go about it. So take them uh, as, a, as a with a grain of salt. What we realize is that even if we introduce definition of protection risk and we want to be more focused on protection risk, in your operation, you are already have a wide and a great deal of information and analysis. And it's very clear to, to, to the many of you and partners what are the protection problems. Sometimes what you have is defined differently. Sometimes are called protection concern, issue, needs, violation, objective. So each operation has a bit of uh, different approaches uh, that is very much related to the type of even language that you use in the crisis. So one way to go about it is don't reinvent anything. So don't just use the risk and change everything that you have. Start from what you have. Look at the 15 definition, reflect where what you have in terms of data problems that you've been identified can fit in those risks. So do that exercise a bit, even uh, collectively, look how the things interrelate together, uh, some of the reflection you had before. And then, of course, work on revise the language. Okay, so don't use, don't use the category specific unless the category is useful for you, but just go about very simply, look at what you have, revise the risk together uh, with um, collectively, and then revise the language to fit for purpose. Okay. The, Comments we have is that the narrative analysis that you use in the PAU is what can explain those correlations. So this reflection exercise is what that actually can inspire, inspire then the way we're going to develop the narrative analysis in the PAUs. But let's look at a, an example. This is coming from an operation. So in that operation, is already identified and very concretely presented by the, by the by the our colleagues on the protection cluster that there is a widespread there are widespread attacks and general violation of human rights. And these are a general situation of safety and security all over the, the country. One specific aspect is that there has been systematic violation of the civilian and humanitarian character of sites, of IDPs and other type of sites that are more informal. There is so many areas specifically related where, where there are attacks that there is a contamination of explosive ordnance, and there are many child protection issues. So this might be some familiar. So this is the way you might have map things out. In that operation, they look at the different risks and then they realize that the core risk for the period was the attacks on civilian and other unlawful killing and attacks on civilian objects. Broadly, that's the risk that is important to show in the period. Then they look back at the four elements that you saw before and they did a reflection. How do they do inter interrelate? Looking at the logic, threats, effect and capacity. So the example there, they realize that attacks and these regards of human rights are the major threat. So is the threat that it's causing and it's impacting the population. In terms of effects, so the threats is the attacks, the effects of all the attacks and all the situation of attacks, it's created explosive border contamination, the no respect of the sites of Sevilla, and of course the injuries, deaths, and so on and so forth. So in the narrative uh, has been presented, these are the attacks, this is causing contamination, which is also a compounding effect of the risks of the attacks. But uh, in specific in this, in this area, no state armed groups and sometimes authority are violating the sites of civilian and everything is related to the attacks. Other elements related to child protection, looking at more of the detail of child protection, some of that has been presented as effects and some as capacity. So here an example. Uh, the rising of child recruitment, so an increased association of children with armed groups, uh, has been uh, a specific um, 
uh, a specific effect. While, for instance, increased child separation has been much more a sort of coping capacity of certain families in certain areas. They decided, of course, to send away their children to relatives and to because they have a tribal uh, tribal uh, tribal network in order to ensure that the children are not impacted by the by the attacks. So as you can see, but of course we presented data on increased family separation, on the recruitment, and so on when we had it. But as you can see, even if there is kids attacks, we were able to present everything that we were presenting before, but in a more logic way between uh, uh, what is actually the main driver and what are the other situation losing the protection ethical frame. Once this exercise has been, has been done, they realized that the wording of the initial definition was not conducive to the, what they wanted to express and what was important to express in the country, so they revised the language. So the language being attacks uh, on civilian and civilian object disregarding the humanitarian character of site because it's a specific situation that is happening there. So the risk is the attacks, but there is the specific situation. So this is really one way of going about it, probably one of the simplest. Uh, but as you can see, the goal is that the risk categories, you don't feel that as prescriptive, but you feel them as a useful tool to reflect together with partner constituency AUIs and maybe other sector on how the things interrelate together and they are having a protection impact on the population. Let me pause there before I, I move to the next example. Is this clear? This example might apply in your operations. Do you see any challenge? Should I move on with the next example? Thank you. How to use existing data? So one of the goals that we, this uh, is a message that is not new. The idea is not to reinvent or recollect new information, but really to make better use of information, data, and analysis you already have. Again, this is another example of another operation. One, one of the exercises they did with the, with the partners, they did an exercise together to assess the information landscape. They, they take each protection risk, and then they structure the available sources of data and information with information needed using the, the protection analytical framework category and subpoenas. So the risk of attacks, which information we have in, in threads, what is the source and which is the actor that has the information, which information we have on effect, which is the actor and which is the source. And thank you, Lauren. I will finish and come back to your point. Thank you. Um, so the things that they've been doing first to do are the, 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 the assessment information escape, then they revise the way the data is presented to partners. So instead of presenting it using, uh, I don't know, the AOR division or specific situation division, they use specifically the path category and subcategory and the path risks. So all partners will think together on the data in the same logic and so on and so forth. And of course, then they presented the, the, the analysis in the protection analysis update with the logic of threats, threats effect, and capacities. Here are one specific example of this ex exercise. So uh, they've been looking at protection monitoring. So it's where it's one of the sources that they, they were using when they were assessing the information escape. And they look at the different section that they have of questions. And they basically mapped out whether those questionnaire information could provide huge, good data on either threats, effect, or capacities, or the context generally. So as you can see here, the numbers 2.1, 2.3 is the way they organize the sub -pillars. But so that helps the IAM colleague to organize the presentation of the data already in a logic of threats, effect, and capacity. So when the colleagues went and drafted the professionalist update, they can really look at the data in combination with the logic we're discussing today. Looking at it, the same exercise, but with a different visualization. So again, in the middle column, you have the protection, uh, the protection monitoring questions. So with the numbers and the question. So if this place, what was the cause of your displacement? If the house only intends to move, why does your house wants to move? And so on and so forth. And the exercise they've been trying to do is to look at whether if those questions and those data was providing something related to the protection risk definition that we've seen generally, 
So it was giving elements in terms of the intensity and damage of harm to understand better the perpetrators and the, the role of actors, or who is affecting. And on the right side is the exercise you have seen before. Then they organize those questions against the path so that they can re represent that logic into the protection analysis update. Again, it's one example, a simple one, because they just did a couple of joint analysis sessions with partners and uh, and they just look together how to use the data. And then, of course, that simplifies systematically the way they are doing the protection analysis update. Uh, let me pause there before I go to the next. Uh, and uh, Lorraine, uh, the main challenges are the availability of data for a recent period of time and cost to construct the narrative. Do you want to come in, Lorraine? Uh, yes, <laughs> I just wanted to say that uh... I mean, it, it, it's complicated to produce this kind of uh, PAU um, with, uh, you know, in the beginning you said for the period January to March, uh, for example, uh, because, yeah, just to give an example, in the RC, we do not have the data for 2023. Um, so it's always complicated to, to be relevant with quite old data and and to argue in the, in the narrative with, yeah, that that's the the main issue I think in the for yeah. us in the development of these PAUs. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lorraine. No, no, but that's uh, that's absolutely. I totally agree with that. There are two elements that we change in the process of the PAU. Um, one being the decision on when to do a PAU is on you. So we stopped the quarterly production as a systematic approach because we realize exactly what you're saying. So that's one of the goal of you having the space to decide what is better to produce a protection analysis update. Uh, that can be informed by certain situations where you want to have it. I don't know, the humanitarian coordination coordinator is changing the strategy in June and you would like to have a PAU before, or it might be related to data. So let's have a PAU in April or in May because then we're going to have better data to present things. So that's that's what I'm saying. That try to use flexibly and discuss well when it's good to pre to present the PAU. Uh, the second element maybe you can use in this situation is the difference between the standard and the brief. So if what we realized that it was cumbersome is to produce any time a PAU that is long because not all the time we have the data. So. Sometimes the brief PAU that is just six pages can be just focused on just comparing maybe previous data and a much more qualitative update from our from our operation. Um, that's another way of going about it. And the third is the general comment that we are realizing that as a global protection cluster, as a protection cluster in general, we we are moving into let's present the analysis even if we don't have strong, strong, strong data, but we know the situation. I mean, uh, I don't want to call in uh, uh, Archu or Afghanistan, but Afghanistan is one of the countries where it's difficult to have data, even if they have very good protection monitoring system. And we actually had that reflection. Our subcluster coordinator, they have a lot of knowledge of what's happening. So let's try to bring that into the PAU sometimes if we don't have the data, so to compensate the lack of data. Again, there are many ways of going about it, uh, and we can discuss further the approach. So our idea is that you are not left alone. Try to look at the guidance. Try to see if the way we approach it or we are proposing to approach in 2023 simplifies some of the processes, and then we can come in and support and so forth. That would be my reflection, Loren. I don't know if I didn't want to address it, but just to keep the discussion, I don't know if uh, there is counter reflection on your side. No. So let me go with the last example, if you don't mind. Um, it's about prioritization. Here, the example is very simple, so probably will not address the challenges that you might find in prioritization. From, uh, from experience of the last year and a half, there are many challenges when it comes to prioritization. But here is one way of going about it. So again, from this operation, what they did, they look at exist existing analysis. The core group, so cluster coordinator, co-coordinator, a very small group, they did the first internal exercise of doing an initial broad list of protection risks using the categories. And started doing this exercise of interrelated. So before starting the, the overall consultation, but sometimes is where things are difficult. Then they involve a very small group of partners and actors that are actually 
strong in the analysis or they're really contributing to our analysis as a protection cluster to revise this initial distribution. So we identified these seven, nine, ten risks, uh, and we realized that what we were presenting before in this this way, we could present it in this other way under this risk or the other risk. They had an initial reflection with a small core group of partners that had been strongly involved in AUS. And then they decided to actually have a joint session of analysis where much broader of an entire day. Um, and then think of having the regular. They had small sessions at the national level and then one at national level to look at the prioritization of that broad list. I don't remember, but I think they identified 9, 10 and look it together with a sort of workshop type of exercise on how to prioritize those lists. The, those those lists. So the first thing that might be interesting for the PAUs, but also others that can be used in the PAU, as we've been discussing today. And then when they went to the PAU, instead of dividing the section by partners, so this section to this partner, this section to the EUR, there was an initial draft by the cluster coordinator coordinator internal uh, using the, the exercise of the joint session. So distributing the five risks, presenting some other elements that are important to present for the EORs even in the contest and so on and so forth. And that has been a, a process of, of short consultation, two, three weeks uh, with co-partner for feedbacks and inputs. And the process was a bit more streamlined that past processes in the same operation. Again, your caveat is that you could, if there are more risks that the partner wants to prioritize or in your, in your discussion, there is a need to prioritize, those can be presented in context or they can be presented in one risk because maybe they might be very related in terms of uh, what is affecting what, what is causing what and so on. So the idea is, of course, the five headings should be five, but inside another thing you can really build to present much more. Again, this was one example. Uh, let me stop there. We are almost at the hour. Uh, on my side, uh, this is the content I wanted to present today. I have just one slide that we already discussed, so it's nothing new. Uh, but uh, I prefer to pause if there is any last reflection, comment or question. Or any challenge that is anyone that sees that you're going to find challenge with this approach. Clear. Thank you, Claudia. Again, the idea is of this webinar is exactly to do it now, so you can really enter into the processes, start using them and learn. And then in April, we're going to have a joint session together uh, to reflect. So the idea is not to do it perfectly since the beginning, but to, to, to actually have a paced approach. We are there for mentoring and support, uh, both on, our, on my side and both from uh, Vincenzo and the colleague of IAM. For anything you need, uh, I will drop my email in the chat. And um, please, Start using them. My suggestion is try to get in touch with your regional focal point, maybe to start map out the processes you have. And if you have a specific request uh, of uh, additional session, if you like to ask to support you in a session to partners, to a session to maybe with the AURs, we've been doing that in the last six, seven months where we've been supporting maybe internal processes at least at the beginning. So very much happy to support and, and completely at your disposal for, for anything. Um, on my side, that's all. Um, I will share there also the link with the materials that is the same of last time. And if there is no any question or other doubts and so on, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for the timing. And I hope that at least it was a bit clear to setting the basis. I mean, we didn't pretend to uh, have a strong capacity building in this webinar, but just to give you the elements to be feel more confident. So. On my side, thank you very much. If you don't have any last burning point, Archu, you had a point. You, I don't know if we address it. I just remember that. Uh, not, not, not really. Twelve and fifteen, but I think we can also chat bilaterally during the next. Yeah, let's. How okay. Yeah. Thank you, Archu. Thank you. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, we will uh, fix a bit the recording and probably publish. So if you want to share it with uh, other colleagues later, that will be available. So thank you very much. Uh, thank have you. Have a great rest of the day and week.